A strong voice was sent out from the Global Forum for Asia by President Xi Jinping that intellectual property rights must be protected through reinstituting the Intellectual Property Rights Office, raising the cost for offenders and fully unlocking the relevant deterring laws. Now, according to the statistics of the World Intellectual Property Organization, China has eclipsed Japan to rank second among countries filing international patent applications and is likely to surpass the United States as the first in three years' time. However, the U.S. is accusing China of stealing American ideas. Concurrently, China is still under the 301 investigation and has suffered additional tariffs for the same reasons. To have a deep understanding on those issues and more today, I'm very happy to sit down with Mr. Francis Aguri, who is the Director General of World Intellectual Property Organization. This is a dialogue. I'm Yang Rei. Welcome to a dialogue, sir. Thank you. We have many different uh, themes uh, at this Global Forum for Asia, and I believe protection of uh, intellectual property rights must be prioritized uh, for those who are seriously concerned about the competitive edge of the Chinese economy. What do you think of uh, the challenges that China is facing about how to protect uh, IPR? Well, uh, look, I think China has undertaken a remarkable journey, of course, as everyone knows. I'm telling you nothing a remarkable journey in building technological capacity which makes it one of the major technolo technological powers in the world. I think intellectual property plays a role in this because you have to find in an incentive structure for people to invest in, in technology and technological creation and intellectual property basically provides that incentive structure. Mm -hmm. What we've seen with China is that it's acquired uh, uh, I would say a world-class intellectual property infrastructure in the course of the last 40 years. Uh, and that shows in the numbers. Uh, the numbers show that China now has the largest patent office, the largest trademark office, the largest design office. It's a, uh, the third largest father of international patent applications. Um, it's the third largest father, second largest father, sorry, the third largest father of international trademark applications. So, uh, I think now the challenge is how to convert all of that into economic activity, which, or in other words, how to commercialize it, because it's an excellent infrastructure. Uh, it's used on a widespread basis uh, by Chinese enterprises. Now, what results are being achieved? Uh, recent years have witnessed a transition from uh, imitation-based economy to one driven by innovation for an upper middle income economy like China and therefore uh, many problems occur as a result of a poor public awareness about how to protect IPR. How can China do to best protect uh, our own intellectual property rights and to promote public awareness? Yes, well of course it's a vast and diverse country uh, and this is one of the challenges. Uh, is, is spreading the knowledge from the eastern seaboard, as it were, right across a very vast and diverse country. Uh, I think that's happening. Uh, uh, it's happening uh, with, through the education system, is one way in which it's happening. It's happening through uh, the general rise in the level of the, of the knowledge input into production. That, uh, the, the, uh, as uh, companies and enterprises use technology more and more, then they're more aware, uh, uh, naturally more aware of the need to protect that technology which represents their competitive advantage. Do you think in the age of digital technology, uh, the protection of uh, uh, trademarks as well as uh, uh, a patency uh, will be featured more prominently? And in fact, uh, the trade war, if any, between the United States and China is compared to battles for the primacy of digital technology by economists, uh, a prestigious journal. Do you think that reflects the truth? I do. I think uh, that what we're seeing is that uh, with China, a new major competitor has arrived on the scene. <coughs> Whenever that happens, you have some tension uh, amongst rival competitors. Uh, so I think we can see this trade, dispu uh, trade dispute in that light that uh, we have uh, an intensification of competition around 
technology and thus around intellectual property which is the means of protecting technology. The United States accused China of trading our market shares for higher technology. China refuses to accept the criticism. I'd like to have your comments. And I can't make any comment on uh, the substance of a dispute between, after all, two member states of our organization and uh, the World Intellectual Property Organization. Uh, it's their business. But what I think one can say is that it, although this is a bilateral dispute between two parties, it does have multilateral implications mm -hmm. because this is a dispute between the two largest technology producers in the world. Uh, so that must have implications for the rest of the world. Furthermore, it's a dispute that's taking place in a globalised context. So the world economy now is globalised, of course. So uh, this will affect, or may affect, depending on how far the dispute goes, global value chains. And global value chains are quite complex and they will involve more than just the two parties. Uh, so I think it's everyone in the world is concerned about this and would like to see it resolved uh, as quickly as possible, possible and uh, as well as possibly. Do you think this uh, concern about IPR protection is also shared by Europeans, uh, taking Germany as an example? Uh, uh, this is the economy that has exported most of the advanced uh, high technologies uh, to China, but at the same time they could hardly conceal their concerns that uh, uh, legislatively, China uh, might uh, protect more of their uh, patency, trademarks or whatever uh, intellectual property rights. Well, let me uh, put it this way. I think Germany uh, in particular and Europe more generally are also major competitors in this field. And then I think what you have is that the competition plays out right across the, right across, uh, uh, the scope of the capacity to develop technology. So. You have competition in relation to human resources, for example. Uh, competition between research institutions and companies for those human resources. You have competition in, in relation to the regulatory infrastructure, and that's what we're seeing here with this particular trade dispute. Uh, so I think that uh, in the case of Germany, they have expressed concerns about foreign investment. <coughs> Uh, they're not alone. Other countries have expressed uh, concern about foreign investment. But let's look at the situation of the world as a whole and we find foreign investment going on from all countries. Uh, and naturally, as technology becomes a more and more important part of the economy, uh, acquisitions and foreign investments are targeted on technology-specific companies. Uh, so. I would see it as, as part of a general intensification of competition which is becoming more fierce and centred on technology. We see entirely two different trends in the age of globalisation. Categorically one stands for more of such a free trade and investment, the other protectionism. Do you think the issue of IP protection has been abused by politicians in times of crisis to promote the trade protectionism? Taking the United States as an example, Mr. Trump wants to put America first, buy America, hire Americans, uh, and therefore uh, we have fallen victim to such waves or tsunami waves of uh, trade protectionism. I think we're all concerned uh, that the forces of protectionism are rising around the world. Um, and we're all concerned that this is part of uh, a closure rather than an opening of the world economy. We've experienced several decades of opening of the world economy. I don't think there, it's in anyone's interest to see a closing of the world economy and protectionism points in this direction. Uh, I think. Uh, there is also waves across the world of populism and populism generally exploits an easy target uh, to uh, uh, appeal to its constituencies. And so we will see that uh, protectionism and coupled with populism does focus on some easy targets uh, and it's easy to make accusations that really need thorough analysis before we can take any position on them. China is uh, taken by the US government as a strategic competitor 
and I said earlier in areas of digital technology, this seems to be an issue of how to win the turf battles, uh, maintaining the primacy of the U.S. leadership in high-tech frontier. So do you think uh, national security has also been abused as an excuse uh, for uh, the United States and uh, they will do anything to nip it in the bud before it's too late. So this is actually a matter of a new Cold War. I think what we see with digital technology and data uh, technology is convergence of all fields. So we're seeing a convergence also of the economic, the social, the political and the military. Uh, and they're converging around an underlying coherent technology which is data and digital technology. So <clears throat> we'll see in it, we've seen expressions, I think, in each of those field, in the fields, the economic, the social, the political, as you've mentioned, uh, and the military in terms of security. Uh, we have to watch this play out, I think. I don't think uh, uh, you know, that we can take any sweeping judgments about this matter, but remembering that uh, at the base of this is competition. In each of those fields, at the basis of it, is competition whether for soft power or for hard power. Uh, and that competition is going to be expressed in many forms. And one of them will be uh, the, the sorts of analyses that are being put forward to appeal to uh, the constituency, the political constituencies that we see. IP theft is one aspect of espionage and espionage is an industry that is as old as prostitution or tax. Therefore, uh, do you think uh, politicians or those responsible politicians uh, should somehow tone down the spicy battles concerning uh, uh, online theft or online espionage so that they would conduct uh, a strategic and economic dialogue to sort it out instead of uh, singling out uh, the emerging market as the target to bash the catch-up economy. Yeah, well I think we all have an interest in a globalized economy uh, in seeing a rational, uh, cool dialogue takes pla take place between competitors and to ensure that competition doesn't move to the dark side. Competition moving to the dark side and you know when you talk about espionage uh, that's a difficulty because we don't have much transparency mm -hmm. as lay people in watching this, uh, this discussion uh, take place. Uh, we have anecdotal evidence. Uh, we know certain things. Uh, but what I think it does emphasize is the need for international dialogue to find appropriate solutions to ensure that security, like privacy or like <coughs> you know, economic incentives for investment in technology, are governed by a set of rules which are fair and balanced to which everyone can subscribe. The new generation of the Chinese leadership with the President Xi Jinping as the core uh, calls for young generation, be they from North America or European countries after getting good education, uh, to benefit from their policy incubation, to encourage innovation, to sustain uh, China's economic growth. Uh, uh, what do you think of the issue of innovation in the new era so that China will hopefully become yet another economic giant? Mm. Well, all the signs uh, are uh, very auspicious, I think, uh, that is taking place. Uh, innovation, of course, is the cream of technological capacity, if you like. Uh, it's the latest products to, and services to enter into the marketplace. And it's that which makes a, an economy competitive. Uh, and it's that which is the hardest to achieve, I think. Uh, but we see innovation uh, in China, of course, uh, we see it in the statistics. Uh, China's performance in terms of the numbers of international patent applications that it's filing, where it's now holds second position, as I said, uh, is quite extraordinary because international patent application really is supposed to represent the best of new technology. It's that part of new technology that you're seeking uh, to internationalize uh, and this is an extremely strong indicator, but we see all the other sorts of indicators uh, there uh, 
speaking in favour of China becoming an economic giant, which it is, I think, already. Uh, namely, number of scientific uh, publications, amount invested in research and de uh, development, the strength of its educational institutions, uh, the, the fact that a number of Chinese enterprises are now global enterprises with, with a huge reach and a huge power. So I think innovation is uh, the secret. It's what everyone is trying to achieve. Uh, and China is performing in this respect exceptionally well. One of the major reasons uh, that have triggered, one of the reasons that has triggered the current uh, trade standoff between the United States and China is that uh, most Americans disagree uh, to the way that the Chinese government runs the economy in, uh, uh, in the context of WTO negotiations and the rules of this World Trade Body, saying uh, the uh, innovative industry should be uh, very much driven by the market forces instead of uh, uh, industrial policies of the central government. In the, uh, against the background of China's traditional culture, of course the strong government plays a pivotal role in building incubation and in attracting talented professionals from uh, uh, the other side of the Atlantic Ocean or Pacific Ocean. So what do you think of uh, this current uh, raging debate as to whether the government should pour more resources into incubation and innovation, or it's very much an issue of uh, non-government forces. Uh, yeah. Sorry, uh, very much an issue of a government forces. Look, it's a very interesting question, extremely interesting question, if I may say. Uh, there is no economy that doesn't have significant government investment in uh, innovation and, and in building technological capacity. Uh, the United States government, for example, invests heavily in health technology, it invests heavily in a whole range of other fields of technology. Roughly, uh, across OECD countries, it's about 60 to 70 percent business investment in the creation of new technology and about 30 to 40 percent government investment. So it's a question of degree then. Uh, Fifty Shades, Fifty Shades, very good liquor. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a question of degree um, and of course there are different approaches of political economy. One of the very interesting things I think uh, in observing the world at the moment is that the two major technological powers, namely United States of America, which I think is still out in front, and then China, have completely different approaches to this question of building technology, uh, technological capacity and innovation. Completely different. So in the United States of America, for example, uh, a report from the National uh, Academies of Science has said, well, actually, uh, it, it doesn't really have a system. The United States doesn't have a system in the sense that there's not one single authority that is setting a strategy. It's nevertheless the highest performer in the production of new technology in the world. Uh, and on the other hand, you have the Chinese system, which is very much led from the top, a strong leadership focus on innovation and the building of technological capacity to enhance the competitiveness of the Chinese economy. So two completely different approaches, both work. Thank you so much, Francis, uh, for being with us. Uh, you are watching Dialogue with uh, Mr. Francis Guri, a uh, very senior expert on protection of intellectual property rights. We are able to interview him uh, discussing whether China will be able to win the uphill battles in not only protecting its own uh, uh, knowledge related economy but also uh, the patency and the high t technology that the Europeans and Americans are seriously concerned uh, in the new era of competition. Uh, stay with us, we'll be right back. Welcome back, sir. Thank you. Um, so what do you think of the role that China plays in this age of globalization? And that's a very tricky issue, right? Well, look, I think China is a, a, assuming a leadership role that is very much welcome. Uh, so it's the second largest economy in the world, uh, <coughs> as we've discussed. It's the second largest producer of technology in the world. Uh, with that comes certain leadership, I think, uh, obligations and responsibilities and is very much welcome to, uh, I think, to be welcome to see China assuming these uh, leadership responsibilities. 
So, what are the major issues on your agenda each day? Since you have so many catch-up economies, uh, they all have the problem of uh, transition. Uh, how to transform themselves from uh, low-income catch-up economies to an industrial nation? Industrialization would, of course, mean you. Uh, uh, change from uh, you have the shift from uh, labor intensive low value added industries uh, to uh, one driven by high technology and therefore do you think you have more of such lawsuits from uh, uh, developing countries where you see more of such uh, foreign direct investment and most of such investment would be related to high technology look um, I think you put your finger on one of the major challenges that we have which is the with differences in technological capacity around the world. Mm -hmm. This is the great differentiator actually in economic performance and uh, uh, in uh, around the world. So uh, the problem is that the acquisition of technological capacity is a long-term game. It's not something that can happen overnight. Now in China we have seen it happen extraordinarily quickly. But uh, for most economies in the world, there are very few graduates in this process. China is one. The Republic of Korea is another graduate in, uh, over this period. Singapore, to some extent, is a graduate uh, in, in this regard. Uh, but the number of examples is very limited. And that's because it really involves such a massive eth effort right across the economy. Uh, and it involves a strategic leadership which we've seen play out in China in a, in a, in a, in a, a massive way, which is, it has been exceptionally important to the development of this capacity in China. But we're left with a situation of great asymmetries or differences. For example, <coughs> the United States of America will spend about 540 billion United States dollars on the creation of new knowledge, research and development. China will spend uh, this year uh, nearly 420 billion United States dollars on research and development as the second largest investor in research and development in the world. That's more than the GDP of about 160 countries in the world. So, in other words, the two largest technological powers are investing more in the creation of new knowledge than 160 countries each have to satisfy all their needs in the public sector from health, infrastructure, defence, security, uh, and so on. So uh, we are left with this situation. We have to work at this and to, I think, encourage countries to undertake this long-term process of building technological capacity, which is your education system, you know, your business uh, and market system, uh, and the knowledge on the part of everyone in the economy of the importance of this sector. Two more issues before we conclude this very enlightening discussion about the protection of uh, intellectual property rights. One is the military-industrial complex. We've been discussing the role of the government, and the United States uh, is absolutely a role model in, in, in this area for showing up uh, the development of uh, civilian industries. So has China raised the idea of uh, uh, civil-military fusion between the two uh, segments? Um, do you think uh, we should have more inspirations from uh, this phrase coined by President Eisenhower in the 1960s? Well, uh, uh, we should remember that a lot of good technology has come out of the military for civilian applications. Taking yes. a computer as an example, internet, <coughs> internet yeah. uh, GPS, <coughs> many, many examples. So let's hope that, that all the investment in uh, military technological capacity does lead to the improvement of civilian lives. Very quickly, the other issue before we uh, come to the end of dialogue. Uh, climate change and global warming. Mm -hmm. Low-lying nations complain that they should be compensated for, for the sacrifice they make. Because in years to come, uh, their island nations will be merged in the ocean waters. And so, uh, there should have been more preferential policies to benefit the catch-up economies like those small in size in the Pacific Ocean. What do you think of uh, this uh, awareness? I think that's the aim of um, the Paris uh, Agreement uh, on climate change. It is to compensate, uh, one of the aims is to compensate those countries that have suffered through the process of industrialization 
that has enriched uh, the developed world in particular. So uh, this is extremely important and the availability of clean technologies uh, uh, and the accessibility of clean technologies uh, is extremely important. I know this is a very difficult issue for politicians to answer and field. I thank you so much for the uh, efforts to enlighten our audience about the importance of uh, IPR protection. China is, of course, a newcomer. We have a lot to address. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ray. Thank you.